Hello everyone. Welcome to this session about model design fundamentals for hardware in the loop testing. During this session, we will explore the challenges and opportunities related to the design and operation of a real-time test bench and how to prepare a proper software environment to better test and debug the controller under test. We will use the example of a solar inverter controller to illustrate the concepts. This session will be divided into three sections. We will first discuss the challenges related to the validation of complex control systems. Then, we will briefly present the concept of hardware in the loop test bench and show how it can be used to test such control systems. Finally, we will dive into more details about the virtual software models running into the hardware in the loop test bench and present an efficient way to design them to facilitate the control system testing. Let's describe the use case. The example system we'll be using for this session is a PV panel connected to a power converter. There could be multiple connection possibilities at the output of the converter, such as a battery or some DC load or a DC microgrid, but we could also imagine an AC output allowing the connection to the power grid. The PV panel generates a DC output, which is connected to the input of the solar converter. Inside the converter, there can be various implementations of power electronic circuits, for instance, the aggregation of a DC-DC converter and then a DC-AC inverter, not to mention protection circuits and measurement devices. From the user perspective, the solar converter converts the input DC into AC to allow the connection to the grid. The power electronic circuits located inside the converter are composed of power switches, which need to be controlled in a coordinated way based on the current and voltage measurements taken at the inputs and outputs of the converter and some external set points. The desired effect of this control is to convert DC into AC, but also to optimize the amount of power that is fed to the grid. These control strategies are implemented into a hidden yet essential component, the controller. It's fundamentally an electronic board with a processor and some embedded software, which is responsible for allowing AC power generation in an optimal way. The embedded software is quite complex and should take into account not only nominal conditions, but also faulty cases to ensure a safe operation of the device. Some fundamental functions need to be implemented in the controller's embedded software, such as startup, DC to DC and DC to AC conversion, control of the output frequencies and phases, MPPT, etc. Other auxiliary functions also exist, such as protection functions, against over-voltage, over-current, over-temperature, short-circuit, etc., and monitoring functions, voltage, current, frequency, phase, temperature, energy quality, and also, and finally, communication with other devices. That being said, what are the issues that engineers face when designing and testing such complex systems, especially the controller? Well, first thing is that we are addressing here a critical system. A malfunction in the system may cause serious damage. So special care needs to be taken when testing and validating such a system. In addition, we often underestimate the complexity of the software embedded in a controller. We are talking about tens of thousands to millions of lines of code in each controller. So one can imagine how laborious it can be to cover all the code with tests. If we could only test on the field with real PV and converter prototypes, we would be facing a significant amount of issues, including the use of immensely expensive prototypes, tedious tests with cumbersome test setups, and endless test combinations to cover. Luckily, there are helpful and efficient solutions to facilitate all the validation process the use of hardware in the loop test benches. These devices include real-time simulators, which are responsible for the emulation of virtual plant models. In our case, PV panel, the converter, and even the grid. Their role is to mimic the behavior of the system so as to lure the real controller under test and make it easier to run countless test scenarios in the lab. This reduces the need to use real PV and inverter prototypes and therefore provides with a safer and test environment for test engineers. Because of the flexibility and the controllability of such test benches, testing costs are drastically reduced while being faster, more efficient, 
and providing a better test coverage. What is the loop we refer to in the expression hardware in the loop? Well, this loop is created by the coupling between the real controller and the test and the simulated PV and converter embedded in the test bench. This closed loop configuration ties the system together tightly. The outputs of the controller become the inputs of the test bench, and the outputs of the test bench become the inputs of the controller. What kind of issues can we face in such coupled systems? There can be two of them. First one is the occurrence of some unexpected event during the experiment. The overall system's behavior does not match our predictions. In essence, this can be good, because the purpose of such testing configuration is to validate that the system fulfills the function it has been designed for, and that no significant malfunction occurs once the final controller has been tested, commissioned, and deployed on the field. So we may have discovered the bug in the controller. The challenge here is to identify the origin of the fault and track down the signals with faulty values. Second issue we would need to tackle is to perform tests out of the standard ranges. For instance, ask the test bench to send out of range values for some signals to check how the controller would react. This use case could be typically illustrated by the loss of a sensor. How would the controller react in case of a lack of relevant information? One way we could solve these issues would be to physically alter the cables between the controller and the test bench, either to measure signals for debugging or to insert extreme out of range values. Well, you can imagine this hardware approach is not the most flexible one as it requires manual hardware modifications. Here is one way we could make this process faster and more flexible. Act on the software part. Do not forget that the test bench is both composed of hardware equipment and software modules. The software part includes the physical model of the plant, in our case, the PV, inverter, and grid. But there are also many more software services available, especially connections between the PV model and the hardware input-output interfaces. Some parts of the model are responsible for receiving signals from the hardware inputs, and others are responsible for sending signals from the PV model to the hardware outputs. And because it's software, we can easily interact with them. For instance, we can perform software cuts to emulate that some signal was lost or a wire was cut, or force values to represent the loss of a sensor or some wrong information. We can also adapt the signal scaling to calibrate input and output signals. All these operations would be controlled from the user computer and can also be automated for better test efficiency and coverage. Essentially, the concept to achieve the signal cuts in the test bench software can be summarized as follows. Imagine control switches, which make it possible to switch the source of the signals. Either the signals automatically calculated by the controller or the PV model in the closed loop, or forced manual signals, making it possible to set user-defined values. In this case, the loop is broken in order to carry out debugging by introducing particular values allowing to highlight and confirm wrong or unexpected values, or to test non-nominal cases, for instance, out-of-range values. Let's have a look at the main software module, which is hosted in the test bench, the simulation model, also called physical model. As a first approximation, we can say that it essentially contains the PV, inverter, and grid model, or whatever other system we are developing. The PV model manipulates signals which make sense to a system engineer. In the case of this example, we are talking about the PV panels, DC voltages and currents, the temperature, the irradiance on the panels, etc. The PV model is connected with some bench-specific interfaces, which connect the model signals to the hardware inputs and outputs. Do not forget that the purpose is to connect the test bench, and therefore the PV model, to the real controller that we want to test. The hardware inputs and hardware output subsystems contain blocks specific to the test bench, which allow to connect the model with the hardware interfaces of the bench. They are, for instance, analog or digital inputs and analog or digital outputs. They can also be signals that are part of CAN bus, Modbus, or other communication protocols. Let's go back to the complete model 
which displays the physical model and the test bench specific subsystems to communicate with hardware inputs and outputs. As you might imagine, the controller's hardware inputs and outputs drive electrical signals in the range of some volts. Typically, it would be digital signals operating at 0 or 5 volts and analog signals operating in the range between minus 10 and plus 10 volts, for instance. There can be tens to hundreds of such signals. The connections depicted in red are hardware connections, a set of electrical wires within a harness which put together the controller interfaces with the test bench interfaces. Obviously, the electrical values at the inputs and outputs of the controller do not reflect directly the physical values used in the PB model, such as output power, temperature, etc. For instance, if the test bench sends a 10 volt signal to the controller, which should represent the output power of the converter or its temperature, it doesn't mean that the power is 10 watt or 10 degrees Celsius. There is a conversion factor to take into account. Similarly, the controller could send some logic command to enable or disable the converter, but this signal would presumably be a 5 volt signal, which would need to be translated into logical values 1, 0 or on, off. So we need to convert the electrical values into physical engineering values at the input of the bench and vice versa at the output of the bench. This is what these questions marks are for. As a consequence, we need to introduce new subsystems in the model to manage this signal conditioning, to convert electrical values in volts into engineering values, such as irradiance, temperature, power, etc., which can be sent to the PV model. Similarly, we need to convert engineering values generated at the output of the PV model into electrical values, which will be sent to the output hardware interfaces of the test bench. In the next few slides, we will be studying the contents of the output conditioning subsystem, framed in red. Inside the conditioning subsystems, we can have multiple functions, such as number one, unit conversion converting electrical values into engineering values and vice versa. Number two, signal scaling, adapting the ranges of a signal. Number three, signal cut, interrupting the sending of a signal. Number four, signal forcing, applying user-defined values for debugging or out-of-range tests. Please note that cutting a signal merely means applying a value which is considered being neutral, for instance, zero volts. In case a real hard cut is required, for instance, in case the controller is monitoring the impedance on the line, there are devices called Fault Insertion Unit, or FIU, which are composed of controllable relays and can serve that purpose. The four functions described in the previous slide can be grouped into two subsystems, as their implementation is tightly connected. Signal cut and signal forcing would be managed together, as well as signal conversion and scaling. Remember that upstream from the conditioning subsystem on the left, we are receiving physical or engineering signals from the PV model. Downstream of the conditioning system, we have the controller, which expects electrical values. Let's have a look at the contents of both subsystems, cut and forcing, and conversion and scaling. The cut and forcing subsystem mainly contains a switch, which selects input signals to be actually sent to the next subsystem. The input signals can be either the engineering signal coming from the PV model, or a user-defined signal, which is the value we want to force. The switch also requires a control signal that tells which of the input signals must be selected for further use. This allows the user to apply values which might not be manageable by the PV model, particularly to test extreme conditions or to emulate the loss of a sensor. Practically speaking, in a simulink-based implementation, we could use the multiport switch block, which has a switch control input and any number of additional inputs to be selected. In this example, we can see two inputs, the measured temperature and the forced temperature. At this point, and no matter whether the selected signal is the one generated by the PV model or the one manually chosen by the user, the effective signal can be transferred to the following subsystem, conversion and scaling. Inside the conversion and scaling subsystem, we need to implement a function which converts engineering values into electrical ones. 
there can be two cases. Either the conversion function is linear or it's not. Let's explore first the linear case. On the left of the slide, you can see a linear function which describes the relationship between engineering values and the electrical ones for a given signal. This is typically the kind of graph that is provided in the data sheets of components such as sensors or actuators. Let's imagine the case of a temperature. The engineering values can scale from negative 20 to 100 degrees Celsius. The corresponding electrical values would scale from negative 5 to 5 volts. So essentially, we need to convert linearly a signal in the range negative 20 to 100 into a signal in the range negative 5 to 5. This can be achieved with some simple arithmetic by applying a gain and adding an offset to the engineering signal. Note that the gain and offset values correspond to the slope and the y-intercept of the linear equation which defines the relationship between temperature and voltage. In case the conversion function is not linear, we can't use any more the gain and offset to convert engineering values into voltages. In this case, we would rather use the lookup table which contains discrete values depicting that conversion. The more samples we have in a table, the more accurate the conversion will be. Usually, an interpolation is performed if the input sample does not match an existing value in the lookup table, which gives reasonable accuracy. In the previous slides, we have explored the contents of the subsystems conversion and scaling and cotton forcing for the output stage, meaning downstream of the PV model. The exact same thing applies to the input stage upstream from the PV model, where electrical values must be converted into engineering values. Let's go back to the complete model to have a closer look at the hardware output subsystem. We already mentioned that it contains test bench specific blocks to connect the software signals to the hardware outputs, but there is an additional detail we need to pay attention to. One important thing to take into account is that the controller's input channels work at certain voltage levels, and sending signals out of that range may damage the controller. Generally, test benches can operate at higher voltage ranges so as to allow more flexibility depending on the controller to be tested. Therefore, we must make sure that the test bench never outputs voltages higher than the maximum supported values by the controller. Setting properly the scaling, as seen before, should allow to generate the proper voltage levels, but a wrong scaling might lead to the generation of a harmful signal. As a consequence, and independently from the scaling, it's a good practice to define systematically saturations at the output stages of the test bench to ensure that an output signal will never exceed the limit values. We can sometimes also implement hardware protection circuits to ensure that these values are never reached. So finally, here is the complete picture of the model with the hardware input stage which receives the electrical signals coming from the controller. In the input conditioning subsystem, these electrical signals are converted into engineering values and go through the switch that lets the signals through or replaces them by user-defined values. The effective engineering signal is fed to the PV model. The PV model generates output signals, which go through the output conditioning subsystem. There, they can be selected with a switch or replaced by user-defined values, and then they are converted into electrical values. Finally, these electrical values are sent to the hardware outputs to be connected to the controller after being saturated to protect the controller input stage. At the beginning of the session, we mentioned the benefits of using such a structure in the model, especially to allow deep debugging in the system. Thanks to this structure, we can consistently track down any signal which is connected between the controller and the test bench and observe into details the different conversion steps. In this way, wrong values can be easily tracked down to their origin. Any signal going through the model, no matter if it's an electrical input or output, an engineering value, a forced value, a PV model input or output, can be monitored anytime from the user computer. This approach also facilitates the implementation of test automation frameworks which would allow the automatic execution and repetition of test scenarios, not only to test functional cases, but also dysfunctional ones. Let's sum up the main ideas of this session. Real-time hardware-in-the-loop test benches 
are fantastic tools which help engineers to develop and test complex control systems involved in a variety of applications. They emulate a complex electrical or electromechanical system, also called physical system, and are connected to the controller, which drives the physical system. The software embedded in a test bench is highly configurable and allows to easily manipulate all the signals exchanged between the controller and the test bench. Functional and dysfunctional use cases can be tested and automation frameworks can have access to the test bench, the software model and the signals to increase the test coverage and efficiency. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the session. Please let me know if you have questions.